are so glad you are here at Camp Creek this morning. We welcome you to worship with us. We're going to start on Christmas songs. Um, last week, I asked the girls to give me some of their favorite Christmas songs. Janet gave me a few, but Jillian just said all of them. So we have to get started. We've got three or four or five today. Would you stand and join us? We're going to worship the King, which is why we come. Come, let us worship the King. Jesus the Savior is born. For the Lord will reign over all the earth. Come, let us worship the King. Jesus the Savior is born. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised through all. We should want to tell others about that. Oh, Lord. 
Good morning. morning. Welcome to Camp Creek this morning. Whether you're here in person, you're watching us online, or we'll be watching a recording of this. Thank you for doing this and for being a part of our worship this morning. Take out your bulletins. We'll just go through some of the things that are happening in the life of the church. Um, Church offerings can be placed in the back on the round table in the box. Um, Can also be sent to the church or This is basically given online uh, at our website, so whichever way you feel more comfortable with, thank you for doing that. Um, Next Sunday, the 12th of um, December, you'll see there is our Christmas program Sunday, and you'll see some things that are happening there. The Whitco Gospel Choir is going to be with us during our worship service. Um, Ladies' Aid will be having dinner, and we'll be having a fellowship carry-in dinner after our service, just a note there that uh, supposedly about 28 people from the choir are going to be joining us for that meal. Janine. So if you are planning on making a 9 by 9 dish or something, just make a 9 by 9 dish. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> make it all bigger. <laughs> That's what Janine is saying, right? Yes. There you go. Um, uh, Next Sunday will be our last day to bring hats and mittens in the decorated box out there. Um, So uh, they're going to be given to the Plymouth Neighborhood Center, and we appreciate that, and I know they appreciate what we do for them. A couple other notes, no donuts next Sunday. That would be our normal donut Sunday, and no children's church next Sunday. So just be aware of those things also. Um, In the back... On the in the in the foyer on the counter there is a jar. It's our it's our Christmas jar. Money is being collected there to give to Heifer Project. Um, and I double checked this morning. That jar is basically taking the place of our offering that we normally take for Saint Libri Mission. So just so you are aware of that, uh, we will not be taking a special offering for Saint Libri, but that money, if you want to give, can go into the jar. And we'll do something special with that, with with Heifer Project. Just a note, the Ladies' Aid does not meet uh, this month. And also that uh, Pastor Roger will be out of the office on Monday and Tuesday this week. So just be aware of that as you think about needs, if you want to contact him. Uh, If you do want to reach out to him, feel free to do that. He'd be happy to answer your request. Also, if you have a a need or a prayer request you'd like Pastor to know about, there are cards in the pew. If you'll fill those out, stick them in the box at the back, um, in one of those boxes at the back um, of the sanctuary, then he'll know about those kinds of things. Anything else this morning in the way of an announcement that uh, you would have for us? Okay, seeing none. Sophie, are you ready? Hebrews 13, 5. Don't love money, be happy with what you have, because Jesus has said, I will never abandon you or leave you. Hebrews 13. Thank you, Sophie. Appreciate that very much. Roger, if you would... uh, Come forward, please. Good morning. Good morning. As we uh, go to uh, spend some time in prayer, thank you, Steve, for bringing those announcements, making us aware of of those things. Um, As uh, we look to spending some time in prayer, just a couple reminders. Um, Shirley Thompson, still in the hospital, Continue to pray for her um, as they're 
uh, continuing to treat her um, and possibly move her uh, somewhere for uh, at least temporary um, rehabilitation and stuff like that. Um, Rena Weaver, um, last thing I heard, she was going to be having a um, eye procedure um, to work on an issue that's there uh, in her eye. And so continue to pray for her. Um, and then we uh, always uh, pray for our missionaries, Ryan Williamson, Chris Howell, and Lee and Jessica Almer. Are there any other updates or additional prayer requests or praises anyone would like to mention this morning? All right, let's spend some time in prayer. Father, we, especially at this time of year, think about the birth of your son. The fact that you sent Jesus, that he came in the form of man. But not just in the form of man, he came as a baby. God, we thank you for the sacrifice you made, for Jesus being willing to humble himself and become human, for all that that meant for us, for us to come and worship the king recognizing that this baby is the king over all, that he is Lord over all, he is ruler over all, he's sovereign over all. Father, we thank you for Christmas, the time we celebrate your birth. Father, we pray that this time of year would Allow us time to focus on you, to focus on who you are and what you've done in each of our lives. God, we lift up the requests of those in our church. God, for those who are uh, sick this morning, God, we pray that you would be working in their midst. God, we pray for Shirley as she's um, continuing to get treatment and God, we pray for um, just availability for somewhere for her to be able to move to, um, to get some rehabilitation. And God, just for this whole process, that you would be um, working to help in uh, her situation. God, healing through the medications and through the doctors. And God, we just pray for her. Father, for... Rena, we pray for the eye procedure that she's going to be having, that you would help that to correct um, the issues that are there in her eye. God, for um, other requests, maybe they weren't mentioned this morning, that you would be just assuring us of your goodness and love in the midst of those struggles in the midst of the hardships, whatever it is we're going through, God, that you would just be um, continuing to show your goodness in the midst of it. God, continuing to show that you provide. Father, I thank you for our missionaries, for Ryan and Chris and Lee. God, we lift up each of them and their families. God, as they continue to preach and spread the word, Wherever they are called to, God, and as they're learning new things, God, as they're planning things for upcoming seasons, God, that you would um, continue to give them wisdom, help them as they are um, making those plans, God, help them in their conversations, continue to bring people into their path that they might preach and spread the good news of the gospel. Father, for us as a church, in this season, may we proclaim 
who you are and all that you've done for us. God, through just the opportunity of, of talking about the birth of your son. Father, I pray for next week, for the choir coming. God, for um, protection, for their health, for their travels um, as they're preparing to come. God, for lives to be affected as they sing um, next week and for the time we will enjoy of fellowshipping with one another and enjoying food afterwards. God, we, we lift up all of those things and God, pray that we would um, just be witnesses for you and your love. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes I forget that this little baby that we celebrate um, at Christmas time was not only the Son of God, but the Savior of the world. I invite you to think about that as we sing Silent Night. Join us, please. <laughs> Cindy whispered in my ear, don't forget to dismiss the kids in Bible memory. So kids, go ahead and go to Children's Church, Bible memory. Don't forget your uh, meeting for lessons this morning as well. Thank you to Jillian and Janet and Cindy for being a part of music this morning. Appreciate uh, the time and getting us prepared uh, as we get ready to go and dive into God's Word this morning. What do you get for the person that has everything? 
I don't know if you're like me, but I I worry sometimes about, well, am I going to get something for somebody and they're not going to like it or they're going to already have it or those kinds of questions. So I've done some work for you this morning. It can be hard shopping for gifts, but I'm I'm positive that the gifts I'm going to show you are some that people probably don't already have. So I've done some work for you. So here's some ideas for some gifts to get somebody that maybe has everything. The first is the bread pillow. I think everybody needs one of these. You can just hug a loaf of bread whenever you're hungry. Maybe it even comes with a spray or something that smell, makes it smell like bread. Um, but most people probably do not have one of these in their house. So something you can give somebody. How about the catch up with Jesus sweatshirt? Maybe somebody in your life needs this sweatshirt. Um, or the Finding Nemo socks. <laughs> Maybe you see yourself wearing a pair of these on Christmas morning. I don't know. Or maybe for uh, the person who always has the cold nose, they come up with these, which are the custom nose warmers. Of course, they came up with them before they, everybody was having to wear masks, but they're still a thing apparently on Etsy. So if you want to buy a custom nose warmer, that's where you can find those. Or maybe for those that have pet lovers, you need to get them a pet swing so your dog does not have to go out on a leash He can just be in your living room swinging um, wherever. These are gifts, but what do you get for somebody that has everything? What do we get for the creator of the world? What can we give to God? Because we know he owns everything, right? Over the next few weeks throughout December, we're going to be talking about the gift for a king. What can we get as the gift for a king? I appreciate Ryan last week speaking out of Philippians 4 and focusing on the giving aspect of thanksgiving. But I I always am surprised I shouldn't be, but we hadn't really talked about what I'd spoken much about lately or where I was heading, and he got up here and spoke about giving, and it really kind of just introduced this series about the gift for a king. This morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1, but before we turn there, I want to just talk a little bit about background. Luke um, is the author of the Gospel of Luke. He, he writes about Jesus, and we're given some of the details about why he writes. Luke is a physician, so he is a doctor, so he is very detail-oriented in the things that he writes. He writes both the book of Luke's, Luke and the book of Acts. And so even in the book of Acts, as we studied through that, we saw some of these details, um, especially as he joined um, Paul and others in their journeying in the latter part of the book. And we, we got to hear about some of the details. So he was, it was almost like reading Luke's journal at times. Yep, we stopped here and we did this, and then we stopped here and we did this. And so Luke is very detail-oriented. He interviewed a lot of people as he was writing this. We, we see that um, And so it's very detail-oriented. Luke gives us his purpose uh, in the very beginning of the book. It's in Luke chapter 1. It starts in verse 1. And Luke writes this, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, so there were others who had written gospels, and I'm not... We don't know exactly when some of the gospels were written. We have ideas of time frames, but we, we know... Matthew, Mark, and John had both all written Gospels. John was later, so he probably wasn't talking about those. But he's saying as many have undertaken that they want to write about Jesus, this narrative, the things that have happened, just as those from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, those at the beginning, the, the disciples who were there and, and witnessed these things, uh, they have delivered them to us. And so Luke is saying, yes, I've, I've gotten this information from firsthand accounts. And then he said, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. And so Luke is writing to a man named Theophilus. We don't know a whole lot about him, but he also addresses the book of Acts to him as well. And he says that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. 
And so Luke is writing to make sure that this Theophilus knows exactly the history of what Jesus did. And it comes from all these eyewitness accounts. And I can imagine as we're going to be reading through some of the narrative, the birth narrative, I can imagine that Luke sat down with Mary and said, tell me about that night. Tell me about all of the circumstances that happened surrounding Jesus' birth. What was it like to sit there? Tell me the things you heard. Tell me the things you saw. Tell me the things you smelled as they were around animals. Tell me all about what happened during that time. And so Mary would begin telling Luke the stories, and I I can see Luke maybe just writing down as fast as he could some of what Mary would tell him. So we're picking up in verse 26 of chapter 1, the events before Jesus' birth. So Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it says this, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favor one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said... Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed. We're talking about a heart of submission out of this passage. We're looking at Mary's heart of submission. And we look at some of the details of who Mary was. And the first point is Mary was just a common girl. She was just a common girl from a normal city. Uh, By outward appearances, you wouldn't have guessed that Mary was anything special. She was just living her life in the most normal way, in the most normal place, with normal routines and normal expectations for everything that was going to happen. And it makes me recall in the Old Testament A shepherd who was out in the field just going about his business when he was summoned to come to his father's house because there was a prophet there named Samuel and Samuel was choosing him to be king. It was David whom Samuel anointed to be king over the nation of Israel. But Samuel, just looking at David, wouldn't have known that that was who God wanted. The Bible tells us that Mary was living in a town in Galilee called Nazareth. You know, the Jews... They tended to look down on those who would hang out or be around Gentiles. And Nazareth was pretty close to the outskirts of the nation where there were some Gentiles there that they would kind of come in contact with. And and as 
Jews came in contact with Gentiles, they, they were considered unclean. And so the Jews who lived in that area were kind of looked down upon by other Jews. We hear the common impression of those Jewish people, what they thought of those who came from Galilee or Nazareth. And it's in the book of John, chapter 1, verses 46. Nathaniel's talking to Philip and telling him, you need to come see Jesus of Nazareth. And, and Nathaniel says this, he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip says to Nathaniel, come and see him. Come and see. The, the common thought was, well, nothing good can come from Nazareth. There's nothing good. Beyond that, Mary was pledged to be married. She was engaged. She was betrothed. And the only way that that could be separated would actually be by divorce. So it was much more substantial or greater than what we would consider an engagement today. If somebody's just engaged, they just break off the engagement. But this type of engagement or betrothal was such a covenant that it would actually have to have a divorce to break it. Mary was young. We don't know exactly when, but Jewish ladies were often pledged to be married just shortly after puberty, which means she's probably somewhere in her early teens. Externally, her life was just common and ordinary until something amazing happened that God chose to tell her the favor that she found with him. That's the second part of Mary's story. There, a heavenly messenger comes with a divine message. A heavenly messenger comes with a divine message. This passage starts by saying in the sixth month. And when you just start there, you don't really get the full context because in the sixth month, you think, well, maybe it's the Jewish calendar, so the sixth month. So like in our calendar, it would be June, but that's not what they're telling us here. We have to go back a little bit. And we read earlier on of a miraculous conception of Elizabeth, and it says that she keeps that hidden for five months. And then Luke says, in the sixth month. So it's in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy when Gabriel comes to Mary and reveals this to her. We know Elizabeth and Mary were related. Some Bible translations use the term cousin. We're not, most commentaries are not sure exactly what type of relationship it was, just that they are related. And it's when the angel comes that there's extraordinary things that happen. And this angelic messenger, we're told his name is Gabriel, he begins to speak to Mary and... A lot of times when angels come and begin to speak, the first reaction is one of fear. Why? Because the angels come a lot of times and they say, their first words are, do not be afraid. And so I don't think angels are probably the cute and cuddly beings that we make them out to be in pictures. There's probably a lot there to be feared or be afraid of. We're actually first introduced to the angel Gabriel way back in the Old Testament at the time of Daniel. Daniel is praying and Gabriel is sent to help Daniel understand the visions he is experiencing. That's in Daniel chapter 8 verse 16. He then later comes to Daniel a second time and he communicates an answer to Daniel's prayer. So Gabriel is a messenger who's sent from God. 
If you go back a little bit in the book of Luke here, Luke chapter 1, verse 20, Gabriel is the one who comes to Zechariah and reveals that Elizabeth is going to be pregnant. In verse 19, it says, And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. So Gabriel is an angel a heavenly messenger sent with a divine message. And we know that Gabriel is one who stands in the presence of God. It's that verse I was talking about, Luke chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, Next, in Mary's story here, there's a clarifying question. Something isn't quite adding up for Mary. Gabriel comes and he says, you're going to be pregnant. Maybe she'd heard about Elizabeth's pregnancy. We don't, we're not told the connection there if she knows at this time until the angel maybe tells her. But she's not quite connecting how this is going to happen. And Luke, I told you, he's a physician He doesn't give us the, okay, and here is exactly how God is going to do this, or his speculation on how he thinks God is going to do it, but he gives us the angel's message on how it's going to happen. And Mary chooses to ask a question. She chooses to say, okay, how will this be? How is this going to happen? The fact that at times, or a lot of the time, we don't understand the things that are happening around us or in our lives, that doesn't surprise God. It doesn't surprise God when we ask questions. The questions how, when, why, where, these questions do not surprise God. And The psalmist, as you're looking through the book of Psalms, the psalmist would often ask questions. Psalm chapter 2, verse 1, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The psalmist asked questions of God. Throughout Psalm chapter 1 through through chapter 30, Psalm chapter 1 through chapter 30, the question is often asked, how long, O Lord? How long will you allow this sin to happen? How long will it be before you come and save us? How long until you respond? How long, O Lord? The psalmist asked in Psalm 10, verse 1, why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? The psalmists are just very real with God. Why? How? The psalmist asks, will you forget me forever as though God has actually forgotten him? The question, who may live on your holy hill? Whom shall I fear? Asked at the beginning of a psalm and then answered by the end. We are to fear God. God expects us to have questions at times, and it's good for us to ask those questions of God, but then we're called to live in faith. We're called to live in light of the faithfulness that God has shown in years past. So the story, Mary's heart of submission, she's a common girl, but a heavenly messenger sent with a divine message. She asks a clarifying question, and the angel tells her there's going to be this extraordinary conception. Isaiah predicted that this would happen. Back in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, he writes, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she'll call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Gabriel is communicating to Mary, 
we see how all of the parts of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are a part of this extraordinary conception. Verse 35, And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and the power of the Most High, God the Father, will overshadow you. We know the child inside is Jesus Christ. And so all three parts of the Trinity are there engaged in whatever is happening. Jesus being placed inside Mary's womb. This was literally the Son of God coming down in flesh. Gabriel communicates that they are to name him Jesus. That's the Greek translation of Joshua. Joshua is a familiar Old Testament name. It means God is salvation or the Lord is salvation. And it would fulfill the promises that God had given both to David that his throne would last forever and to Jacob Abraham through Jacob that there would be one born of Abraham's seed who would bless the nations of all the earth. So there's going to be an extraordinary conception the angel tells Mary. He gives her the information she needs to know. J. Vernon McGee says this, anything God determines to do, he can accomplish because there is nothing impossible with God. How does God remain fully God and fully human and yet be a fetus, be a baby, be helpless? I don't know. I don't have the answers for that. I know that he is, but anything God determines to do, he can accomplish because there's nothing impossible with God. At, God, at times, God chooses to do extraordinary things through the ordinary. Quite often, God uses just ordinary things people to accomplish his extraordinary things. Mary's just one example of that. You could look through the rest of the Bible and see all of who God uses, just ordinary people that God chooses to use for extraordinary things. Well, the result of this was complete surrender by Mary. The term Mary uses, the term servant there, Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That term servant there, some Versions of the Bible choose to use the term bondservant. It's a term that expresses complete obedience. Mary declares herself fully obedient to the command, the angels proclaiming. The angels proclaiming, this is, this is going to happen. And she says, let it be to me. I am your servant. It's like a servant in those times would have completely submitted 
to the master's will. There wouldn't have been a questioning of the master's will. There would have been complete submission. And that's where Mary finds herself. She says, let it be to me as you have said. Let it be to me according to your word. Warren Wiersbe says this, Mary's believing response was to surrender herself to God as his willing servant. She experienced the grace of God. That term favor there, when the angel comes and says, you have found favor with God, that means that God's grace is upon her. She experienced the grace of God and believed the word of God, and therefore she could be used by the Spirit to accomplish the will of God. There are times in the Bible we see resistance to the will of God. The most prominent example I always think of is Jonah. Jonah's given the word of God. You're to go and preach to the city of Nineveh. But what does Jonah do? He says, I'm not going to Nineveh, I'm going to Tarshish. I'm going to get on some boats. I'm going to get on a boat that's sailing to Tarshish. The complete opposite direction. Tarshish was across the sea all the way to the west. Nineveh was just a little jaunt, probably a couple day journey by foot. But Jonah disobeyed God. He didn't say, okay, God, I'm your servant. I'm going to go do this. Even when he went to Nineveh, he did so reluctantly. And then he gets mad after the results and he pouts because they actually accept God's salvation. What's the heart there? Well, Mary's heart is a heart of complete surrender. I have to believe in Jesus growing up that he probably heard this story about an angel coming and giving this message. He was probably told the story of his birth and what happened, all of the details that surrounded it. I have to think that Jesus growing up witnessed Mary's submission with her life that it was demonstrated here. But we're told that this is actually an attribute of who Jesus is as well. In Philippians chapter 2, before the conception even happened, we're told, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, previous to his coming physically to this earth in the form of a man, did not count Equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Same word there. Being willing to completely submit to God. Being born in the likeness of men. As a baby. And being found in human form. Later in life, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That servanthood we see both in Mary and in Jesus is also supposed to be characterized by us as well. So the question we're going to be asking is, what can you surrender as your gift to Jesus? What can you give the one who has everything? Well, God calls us to surrender our hearts to him, surrendering our very will to his will, allowing him to work in our lives. And so a heart of submission is what we're called to as Christians. That's the first step for us as a Christian, is to surrender our heart to Him. Surrender our will to His will. 
But if you're anything like me, you recognize that that's not just a one-time event. That becomes a daily process of surrendering your will to God because I want to pick up my will and do my own thing. And so we can surrender our hearts, our wills to God and allow Him to rule and reign over us. David recognized this. David in 1 Samuel, I told you, Samuel was sent to anoint the next king. He went through all the sons and he said, well, there's no more left. Jesse said, there's, there's only one left and he's, he's out in the field tending the sheep and Samuel says, I'm not going to sit down until you send him. But he, he looked at some of the sons and said, surely this must be the king. He looks great. He's tall. He's built physically. This one must be the king. But this is God's response, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. He said Mary was just a common girl. Later in David's life, He penned these words in Psalm 51. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. David's getting at the heart of who God is. And he says the sacrifices of God, your gift, what you can give to God, are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise these things. Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. David says, I would give you a sacrifice. I would slaughter a lamb for you if that would would help this. But what you really desire is a broken and contrite heart. God calls us to a heart of submission. Would you pray with me? Father, allow us to work in this time. Use your word to penetrate our hearts because that is the only thing that can change your word and your spirit working within us. God, help our hearts. Help us to surrender our wills to your will. God, I pray that we would be able to daily say to you, God, I surrender my heart. May our hearts be broken before you. And may you accept that as your gift this season. As we offer these things to you. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to stand with us this morning, if you would. We'll be closing today with two verses of Hark the Herald Angels Sing that are singing glory to the newborn king. Joyful
think these passages we read through that talk about Jesus' birth, the songs we sing, I think at times we can lose the wonder of Christmas. My prayer for you is don't lose the wonder of Christmas this year. Recognize that it was God sent as a baby, that he humbled himself to be born as flesh. The angels came and rejoiced over who, over what God had done, that he had sent his son to be born as a human. Let the songs of Christmas, the Christmas carols, bring some of that wonder back to you this year. I pray that for you all. Have a great week. God bless.